Isolating target genes. Okay, so we're going to learn a fair bit about gene technology, genetic modification, and this is pretty much absolutely crucial to your understanding of that, especially the first thing we're going to look at, which is number one, restriction enzymes. You may see your textbooks call them restriction endonucleases. That's fine too. Restriction enzymes is easier and less of a mouthful. Okay, so what do we need to know about these guys? Well, these are used all the time and the most commonly asked. The other two methods we're going to look at down the bottom, they do come up. You do need to know about them, but restriction enzymes are absolutely essential. So DNA contains palindromic sites or sequences. I'm going to put palindromic in red once. It's not a key term you have to use in answers very often at all. An example of a palindrome is something that reads the same forwards as it does backwards. So an example of a little sentence that does that is never, odd, or even. We read this forwards, obviously we can see, read it, N-E-V-E-R-O-D-D-O-R, and then E-V-E-N. So this is something that reads the same forwards as it does backwards, and we're going to look at some examples of how that works in DNA. So restriction enzymes are going to cut DNA at specific palindromic sites or recognition sites. We can call them recognition sites, we can call them restriction sites, there's lots of terminology here. I'm probably going to go with restriction sites to match the restriction enzyme. And we call the palindromic sites, we call them either restriction, yeah, I'm going to call them restriction sites. Okay, so let's look at what that might look like in DNA. So I'm going to draw my target gene in green, double-stranded. So there's my target gene. Either side, we're going to have a bit of non-coding DNA. This could be a long section of non-coding DNA, could be a short section of non-coding DNA. Try and keep everything nicely lined up when you're drawing your diagram. And then I'm going to draw one of my palindromic recognition sites here. And obviously the DNA will continue, dot, dot, dot. We're only interested in this bit though. Okay, so this is my recognition site. And if I were to zoom in on that, and we were to give you an example, you don't need to know any specifically. We could have something like C, T, T, A, A, G in this direction. And obviously if we do our complementary pairs, we have C, T, T, A, A, and G in this direction. So that's what we mean by our palindromic site. As I said, you don't need to remember them specifically, but you need to be able to recognize them and know that they are the substrate effectively for the restriction enzymes. That's where the active site joins or binds onto. So next up, we can say if there's a restriction site, one of these guys, either side of the target gene, we can use it to cut it out. You'll be a bit careful with your it. Here I'm referring to the target gene. It should be quite obvious if, if in doubt and you're not sure that it's clear what you mean by it, use target gene again. It's not very good English, but it's better for your exam. Okay, so let's draw another restriction site on this side. Could be the same restriction site, could be a different restriction site, in which case you'd need a different enzyme because they're specific. The palindromic sequence determines which restriction enzyme is needed. And last of all, we can say that using a restriction enzyme is going to leave what we call sticky ends. Now, this is a key term. Sounds a bit amateur, but it, this is what you need to call them, sticky ends. And sticky ends are unpaired bases. So let's look at that on the diagram. So all restriction enzymes, no matter what, which one, we're going to cut DNA like this. It's not overly surprising. Let's say the active site is complementary to the beginning, to the CT part. Well, the CT part is here and the CT part is here. So it cuts at this point and at this point. So it's not totally crazy that that is what happens. 
and it's always the same a zigzag like that. So what we end up with once this has been cut out, obviously try and keep everything in line again. It makes your diagram easier to keep everything straight. We've got that. We'll match the non-coding bits. And then the top here, this one is included, but the bottom one is not included. So this is unpaired here. And then it's the opposite on the other side. So we have the bottom tail and not the top. So these are the sticky ends. which contain unpaired bases. And the green I probably should enable it is our target gene. So each time you use a specific restriction enzyme, you're gonna end up with the same sticky end. So this is super useful in gene technologies because if we then, because DNA is universal, we find, let's say, this recognition site in another bit of DNA from a different organism. If we use the same enzyme, it's going to cut the same site and it's going to leave the same sticky end. So this sticky end would be CTTAAG and the complementary partner to that will be the same. Will be um, the same if we use the same enzyme. And therefore we can use this to basically cut and paste DNA um, a little bit like we can with a Word document. Okay, so this is by far the most important section that you're going to need to know on this. There are two other methods that we can isolate a target gene. Next up, we're going to look at reverse transcriptase. Okay, A's, it's an enzyme. What does it sound like? Reverse transcription. So what does transcription do? Well, this is a, the only downside with using restriction enzymes is you've got to use the DNA and there's only two copies of each gene in the cell from your one from each homologous pair which means it and it's in the nucleus it's folded up around histones it's all a bit difficult to access so the downside of restriction enzymes is it's there's not that many copies whereas uh, a cell that's producing actively producing insulin for example is going to be making lots you've only got two copies of the gene be making lots of messenger rna so let's say cells only have two copies of each gene and they're both in the nucleus, not the easiest place to access. But we can take, this is actually an enzyme from a virus that does transcription backwards. So normally, transcription is gonna go from DNA to messenger RNA. And I'm going to represent this one with a blue arrow. So we're familiar with this. And this is done by the enzyme RNA polymerase. They do like to test you on your enzymes, make sure you're clear with them. So the A is an enzyme that makes the polymer of RNA. We're making RNA. Straightforward. We can actually do this backwards. And we can go from messenger RNA. I'm actually going to redraw these into something that we call complementary DNA, which is known as little c DNA. And this is done by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So we call this complementary DNA. It has no introns. If we remember from transcription, DNA is made into an a copy of pre-mRNA, which contains the introns and the exons. If that's not familiar, you can go back and check that video. Um, but if we start with the messenger RNA, the introns have already been removed. So we do lose a bit of information, but we can still make the gene from it. So that's all the bits that we kind of need. This enzyme came from a virus. I don't think you need to know that. Never seen any questions on that. So we can just basically take some messenger RNA from the cytoplasm and make the DNA using this enzyme. The third method by which you need to know how you can make a gene if you want to is artificially to synthesize the gene. Okay, so here we can use what the, what the specification calls a gene machine. That's in the spec, you will be able to use that in your exam. And basically this is making DNA from scratch.
So what you do is you basically design in however you want your your protein to be. Uh, you design the amino acids that you want it to be made from, and then you know what DNA bases you need it to be made from. But you can only join about 25 nucleotides together at once. This forms what we call an oligonucleotide. which is a string of 20 to 25 bases. Oligo, if you see that prefix anywhere else, it means short piece of, basically. We can then join the oligonucleotides together in order to make a synthetic gene. And this allows you to basically design your own genes or proteins from scratch. And that's it. Most, most, most important, the questions that they always ask is basically this one. Questions do pop up. This is new. This does pop up from time to time. That this one, this is the most universal to all of the gene technology sequences that you're going to be doing throughout this part of the course. So if you don't understand what these words are, then you're kind of screwed. So make sure you do. It's not that complicated. Remember, you've got the restriction sites, restriction enzymes, that the active site is going to be specific. Each restriction enzyme is going to cut at a different restriction site. And if you use the same restriction enzyme on any piece of DNA, you're going to form sticky ends, which are complementary, which means you can join them back up again, which is the useful thing about them. That's it.